So what is the nature of science? I'm going to talk about general concepts, vocabulary, and method. Science is a way of learning about the natural world, and to do that we use a process that is intentionally designed to reduce the chance of being misled. There are three questions that scientists try to answer. The first one is, what exists? What really is out there and what happens in reality? Why does it happen? And how do we know we are correct with our ideas about why it happens? So that first question is really asking an existence question. What exists? And then we look for cause. And then we measure how certain we are of our ideas. What science is not is just an accumulation of facts that are unrelated. Science is also not an ultimate proof of truth. In the philosophical sense, science cannot prove truth, but it can prove something to be false. Also, science does not deal with the supernatural like ghosts or magic. It's not intended to answer moral questions of right or wrong, although those are extremely important questions. Science deals with how something works, not the grand questions of why. And those imp are important considerations for philosophy, for ethics, religion, or spirituality. So um, please don't eliminate those from your life. They're extremely important moral questions of right and wrong and why. But science itself as a process does not really address those. It's not intended to answer them. Well, here's something odd. Here's a giant tamale, and it's attacking this man's head. It's floating in, in space, and it's going to plaster his face, and it's extremely large, bigger than his head. Now, if you believe me, we would say this is an extraordinary thing that I'm saying, that it's floating, and it's bigger than his head. And in science, we would say that if there is an extraordinary claim, something really weird and different, it requires extraordinary evidence. In science, we are cautious about extraordinary claims. We say, okay, well, might be true, but show me the evidence. Oh, here's some people who are debating. They look like they're having a big argument. Discussion and revision of ideas in science is a healthy process. Debate is not evidence that a theory is fatally flawed. And this is where people sometimes don't understand that when scientists are debating an issue, it's not like this is a breakdown in the scientific method. This is a natural part of science where people discuss and revise ideas. Turning to some vocabulary words that are important to understand for the nature of science, we have hypothesis, law, and theory. A hypothesis is a tentative, meaning like maybe it's going to be this, explanation for a scientific question that can be tested by experimentation. So it's important that this question is testable. If you can't test it, it's not a scientific question. So it has to be measurable in some way. And in junior high, we like to write our hypothesis as a, a conditional statement in the form of if-then. If CO2 concentration increases in water, then the pH will decrease, is a hypothesis written in that form. Theories are general sweeping explanations that explain many different experiments, many different hypotheses that are all supported by experimental data. Scientists use laws and theories to explain and predict what we think is going to happen. We use laws to describe what nature does under certain conditions, and we use those laws to predict what will happen as long as those conditions are met. For example, Newton's laws describe very well how the force on an object is related to its mass and ex its acceleration. We use theories as a comprehensive explanation for a variety of observations of some important feature of nature. We have to be careful here because the word theory in common speech often is used uh, ca uh, casually, like, oh, I have a theory that Johnny loves Susie, 
and we, we just talk about it as if it's an, a quick idea. But in science, the word theory is a big deal. It's a really well thought out, deep explanation that covers a whole variety of phenomena. So here's an example of how broad reaching a theory is and how it comes from a lot of different fields of data. Here is um, a mountainside that shows a lot of layers of rock in different colors. So this is the subject of geology about how rock layers lower down are older than ones that are up higher and the ones that are down lower would have different kinds of fossils than the rock layers above meaning that some life forms have changed over time. Here's a lotus leaf and if you were a botanist and studying the nature of plants and looking into their cells you might study their DNA and here's a, a model of DNA. In the study of genetics you might notice some similarities between different plants and that would be interesting in that you could see connections between different species right now a living today. They might have genetic similarities. Here's a, the bottom of a snake um, and it has some little vestigial hind legs even though snakes don't have legs now this one still has these tiny little remnants of hind legs so looking at the structure of of skeletons of animals we can see common features among animals all of these different studies of animals structures here in this image we have darwin's finches he studied their beaks and looking at genetics evidence and looking at geological evidence all of this comes together to create a theory of evolution, for example. Scientific theories are supported by many different facts and experimental evidence from many different disciplines and that's gathered over time. Here physiology, genetics, and geology all come together to support the theory of evolution. The nice thing about theories is that they allow scientists to make predictions about phenomena that we have not yet seen and that's the power of a theory. For example, the theory of evolution, of evolution predicts the fact that living ch things change over time because of selection pressure. So here is a um, Labrador retriever who is dedicated to balls and he's wishing that I would throw the ball for him. Totally obsessed with balls. And then here's these little chihuahuas who are pretty much obsessed with their food. These are the results of selection pressure by humans breeding them for certain traits we wanted. So animal breeders have used this fact that living things change over time to select for desired traits. Scientific theories are objective. They consider all the data even if it's data that wasn't expected or doesn't go with your hypothesis. They, scientists have to consider all the data. Scientific theories are rational. They make clear logical connections between data while forming the theory. And scientific theories are subject to modification. They might change. And this is how science differs from religion because often religion does not change if there's new information, but scientific theories do. Um, there may be some challenge to current theories that is uh, sufficient to allow us to change it. Also, a new theory might lead to us to look at old observations in a new way. One might ask, in science, in the nature of science, is there one scientific method? In junior high, often people are taught that there's a certain sequence. But I would say no, there's not one scientific method. Traditionally, we teach it that first we start with an observation, which leads us to a question which then leads us to do some sort of background research, consult the scientific literature, ask experts for their knowledge, and then we form an if-then hypothesis, which is testable. We do a controlled test having only one variable, the experimental variable. All other parameters are constants. And after that controlled test, we analyze our results and look for trends and measures of central tendency tell us what generally is happening. 
We can do significance testing in order to determine how likely it was that there was a significant result. Then we form our tentative conclusions, and with those conclusions we share them with others. We do what's called peer review. We communicate our results and let other people know about what we found out. So this is the traditional view of a rather linear process, but in fact it's not that way. Real scientists do mix it up. For example, once a person analyzes their results, they might discover that actually their hypothesis itself needs adjustment, and they might go back and readjust their hypothesis. After they form conclusions, they might go back and redo their hypothesis again before they communicate their results, so that they can go repeating the whole entire controlled test process. After doing background research, somebody might realize that their question was ill-informed and now knowing more they might revise their question. So it really is a flow in many directions, it's not necessarily one way. What is important to remember about science is that the active basis of all scientific knowledge is from observations and experiments. And there are some essential items for credibility in this regard. Scientists necessarily must do accurate, precise record keeping during their experiments. There's openness. They should be able to share the results freely with other scientists and not be afraid to share. My cat is meowing at me right now. Hi kitty. Sorry you're gonna hear the cat. There's a high degree of replication and meaning that the experiment should be repeated over and over again and be able to be repeated in another lab as well. Also the design of the experiment should be a double blind experiment. When you're measuring your results you don't know what was supposed to happen so you measure and look at your results just unbiased clearly without thinking, oh, I'm supposed to be seeing blue, so I guess I see blue, don't I? Uh, this is a problem in science in poorly designed experiments, rather. Um, people tend to have a what's called confirmation bias, where we look for what we expect to happen and then we see it. And this is a natural human tendency, there's nothing we can do about it, it exists. Well, we, we can do something about it, we can be aware of it and try to resist it. So the scientists design their experiments so that the person who sets up the experimental groups is not the same person who actually measures the results. And so the person measuring results doesn't know what they're supposed to be seeing. Scientific methods are also iterative, which means they're repetitive. Scientists address the same question over and over again and each time with more precision in time and space, with more depth and complexity of understanding. For example, a long time ago, Gregor Mendel asked, how are traits inherited? And he did some research with pea plants, and he discovered that they're inherited in separate packets. That's over 200 years ago he discovered this. Now, readdressing the question in a deeper way, People discovered in the early 1900s that traits are inherited on chromosomes. And then later they discovered that chromosomes had DNA and that those inherited traits. And then it was discovered by Rosalind Franklin, Watson, and Crick that there's a double helix that is DNA that contains the traits. The way that those traits were transferred into the synthesis of proteins was worked out in the 1960s. So we went from how are traits inherited in little packets all the way to being able to define the inheritance of genetic codes that code for proteins which create elements in cells. So we had an ever more deeper knowledge as we spiraled down into the depths of understanding in a smaller size scale, also at more precise time scales. So we address these questions with more and more precision over time. Where that leads us um, is the unknown question. This is the joy of science, is that there's always something more to know. So I hope today that you learned the three questions of science 
and you learn the differences between hypothesis, law, and theory, but you know that they are all supported by facts. And I hope you learned about the overview of the scientific method, that it's repetitive, unbiased, and always with peer review. So, I hope that was helpful. Thank <laughs> you.